Welcome to the Trail Doc Podcast. I am John Onate, and I have a broad interest in healthcare, mental health, science, and sports, particularly trail and ultra running. I am an academic physician and teacher. In this podcast, I will talk with experts and high achievers who have insights that we all can learn from. Hopefully, we can share information and introduce you to some amazing people that you will find interesting and helpful. This is a work in progress. Please let me know what you think, and I will welcome suggestions for future episodes. Thank you for listening. Welcome back to our podcast. I hope you enjoyed the first two episodes, and um, as we grow our conversation, please, you know, as I said before, you know, send me, um, in, you know, feedback comments, ways we can improve this. So today, um, I have a really excited to share with you a conversation I had with a medical chaplain who's currently at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, They have a a fellowship um, that draws people from all over the world to train in hospital chaplain. And this is something that I had a lot of experience with in residency uh, in Chicago, and I've had I've, some of the most um, powerful experiences in healthcare I've had have involved uh, medical chaplains really contributing to in, in an important way into the care of patients. Um, and so I was really excited that Robin agreed to talk with me and talk about his fellowship, talk about his personal experience on how. The pandemic has affected his training um, and some of the unique uh, experiences he has. So I hope you enjoy this and thank you for listening. So welcome, Chaplain Jew, to the Trail Doc Blog uh, podcast. And um, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Robin. I'm a chaplain uh, here at a UCSF Medical. Um, I've been a chaplain for the last uh, three years as a medical chaplain. And then before this, I was a jail chaplain uh, for a couple of years. And um, I'm happy to, happy to join you, John, today uh, on your show. And uh, just wanted to uh, just kind of, I guess, share uh, some, of my, uh, some of my journeys here at the hospital amidst uh, COVID-19. And uh, mm. just to uh, Glad, glad to get this call from you and, and to do this podcast with you. So thanks for having me, John. Yeah, I think a lot of people listening would be, um, you know, would be very interested to hear, you know, your perspective, you know, as, you know, as a, as a chaplain and, you know, and, and more of the spiritual and human side of this. Um, I've, you know, I've recorded a, a, a few interviews with healthcare professionals and, um, but I do think, um you as a chaplain have a very special view. Um, in my personal experience uh, as a resident and physician working in the hospital, I think the the medical chaplains are can be such an important part of of the the journey uh, someone has when they're in the hospital. Um, and so I definitely commend you doing it. So I didn't know that you were a chaplain in the prison before. How how long have you been a chaplain? Well, it's kind of a long story, John, but. Um... At one point, I was discerning to become a, a Catholic priest uh, in the church. And uh, during my years in seminary, you know, we have a lot of uh, like pastoral assignments. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be assigned to uh, schools and parishes and, and even jails. So uh, I, I worked at a county jail in, uh, in Milpitas, and I've also worked at the juvenile Desen- detention center um, at uh, Orange in Orange County. So just, uh, just volunteer work, you know, kind of more like an assistant chaplain, really assisting the deacon or the assigned priest uh, for that unit. So it, it was just a learning experience. It was very humbling. Uh, and it was a great opportunity to, for me to really uh, just be present. And I, I think that's what, uh, that's what my work is, is to really be present with folks, uh, you know, in good times and in bad, and, and even in the most, most uh, difficult moments in grief and sadness. Uh, mm. That's kind of like my background a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And, and how did you um, find out about the, the program at UCSF? Uh, well, in order to oh, wait, wait, become a... Uh, stepping back a bit, what's the, what's the actual title of the program at UCSF? Actual, sure, sure. The actual title of the program at UCSF is called a CPE Residency. Uh, so CPE stands for uh, Clinical 
pastoral education. So it's a type of a learning environment, which um, is kind of based on like giving feedback, uh, giving and receiving honest feedback and really working on ourselves. Uh, a lot of times as, as chaplains or even as like counselors or medical professionals, sometimes our own um, hurts, our own trauma, our own kind of uh, things that maybe we haven't worked out. Those kinds of things can get in the way, uh, especially uh, especially in my line of work, where really we're really talking about uh, people's um, really like secrets or really very heavy things that they often share with chaplains. So this program really helps to not only um, uh, work on our, our professional chaplaincy, but also to work on our internal work as chaplains. Uh, it's 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 can be quite damaging, and I have seen this uh, in in my years. Um, as a as a student as a seminarian, um, often religion can be um, can be traumatic. Uh, it can it can be a, a negative experience, and a lot of times that's often tied in with uh, maybe a spiritual leader's um, uh, I guess neglect of t- taking care of oneself first. Yeah. So I always I always believe in the philosophy that you must be healthy first in order to help others. Um, so part of this program is to really take a look and to really reflect on ourselves. Uh, to work on our on ourselves and also to to be uh, to be a chaplain for others to to be a good listener and to be a guide. How, how many people are in your program? Uh, our department, uh, I think we have sixteen residents, and we have about I want to say about six or seven staff mm. staff chaplains. So it, it's a pretty large program. I, I want to say it's one of the largest in the country. Mm. Uh, of course, you know UCSF is is definitely uh, world renowned, and yeah. it was my number one choice. And I was really blessed uh, that um, the superiors, uh, the directors of this program, accepted me uh, to uh, to really to join them in, 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 in this learning process and to grow as a chaplain. Is it um, primarily Christian, or is it what's the what what type of uh, chaplains or relig- uh, sure. religious leaders are in the uh, in the program? Yeah, um, so I know this is kind of a, a common question I get. Uh, a lot of folks have this uh, kind of misunderstanding that all chaplains are like pastors, uh, but that's that's really that's kind of far from the truth. Um, chaplaincy it's is not it's not only about religion. It's really mm-hmm. about just spirituality, and it's about uh, spiritual care. That, that's kind of a uh, the way I frame it. Um, some some healthcare. So I work for um, hospices also, and uh, sometimes they frame it as spiritual counselor. Uh, so that's kind of another title for chaplain. So you'll see, like, I know some places they call me pastor. Sometimes they call me priest. Sometimes they call me chaplain. And, and sometimes they call me spiritual counselor. So um, as far as, like, the religion and the background, it, it does require uh, for one to get, a, like, a theological degree to officially become a board-certified chaplain. But not all chaplains are religious, and not all chaplains are Christian or Jewish or or whatever. Um mm-hmm. I think for me personally, uh, I, I come from a Catholic background, but I'm, I'm more kind of progressive. I'm more, I'm more open-minded. Um, I, I consider myself an interfaith Christian chaplain. That's kind of how I identify my own spirituality. Mm. Um, but I have colleagues, uh, I, would say, I would say mostly Christian, but mm. even that, you know, the Christianity is such a wide range, you know. Yeah. So, you, you know, I have colleagues who are Quaker, Presbyterian, Baptist. Uh, evangelicals i mean just you got the whole gamut gamut so it's definitely a wide range but uh yeah that's kind of like the the religious backgrounds of us chaplains mm. and the the program started in december is that right of um, negative no it started in september so oh september kind of follows the school year yeah got it got it yeah so we're going to have the new incoming class uh this this coming september so, so I imagine like the first few months compared to now has been very, very different. How, how, how was that transition? Yeah, John, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, nobody saw this coming, right? So, um, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, I think being a chaplain itself is already very difficult. I mean, um, it, it's a hard job. Um, you know, we, we're often uh, called upon uh, in crisis situations and palliative care and ethical situations. Um, so it, it is a very stressful job, but on top of that, now we have this COVID and it's, mm. uh, it's really kind of reframed the landscape of how we chaplain. 
And to answer your question, um, right now, like we're still adjusting to be honest, but those first few weeks we were getting tons of emails and just every, every day, I think my superiors were updating us on a new policy change and uh, precautions on how to, how to, how to uh, chaplain uh, with patients who are potentially COVID positive. Mm. Um, so it was uh, very uh, scary. Yeah. And I think, I think even now I, I, I still feel that um, I'm still adjusting. Like I, I'm still adjusting uh, um, to the situation. I, I think all of us in my cohort um, definitely are, are grieving. We definitely have some sadness mm. uh, as our program has shifted dramatically. I mean, uh, most of us, I mean, I can speak for myself, but most of us, I think, are, are um, like, I, I'm, I'm going into work about three times a week. And then the rest, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, telehealth, you know, I'm doing yeah. calling patients remote. So it's just, it's just not the same, John. Yeah. So it, you, you feel like a, you, a, a disconnect from, like, you can't interact with people like you normally would. And I, I can definitely um, relate to that. I think, you know, we have, we rapidly adjusted to a very telehealth approach, which, you know, and some has some advantages in, in that, you know, patients don't, it's, you know, it's more convenient. They don't have to go anywhere to come see me. But at the same time, you know, there is a, a big difference of not that presence of being in the room with them, of laying hands, you know, and during the physical exam and that connection um, that I think I, I definitely understand. And that loss. And also I think our, my clinic is empty. So, so many people are working remotely and, mm -hmm. and people have been calling in sick and, and it's just not, it doesn't have that same kind of, you know, vibrancy of, of a workplace. And I can, and it's, I think your, your term of, of grieving is, is, is um, interesting. So not only grieving the stress of what's happening, but like what's happened to your program. Absolutely, John. Absolutely. I, I think a lot of my colleagues and I, um, uh, you know, we've been blessed as chaplains. We're very kind of uh, intuitive and uh, we really try to support each other. You know, self-care is kind of our, our MO. Um, so our, we do a lot of like uh, check-ins. We've been doing like weekly or bi-weekly check-ins with staff and definitely folks are uh, definitely um, grieving, grieving the loss of the program, uh, worried for our families, mm -hmm. worried for word for our loved ones, uh, concern for our patients. You know, many of our patients are alone now. Um, they're really alone. And especially the folks who are very ill, um, it's, it's such a dark moment for them. And, and we are grieving with them. We're, and then even the staff, like right now, we're, we're really focused on staff, staff support at UCSF right now. And um, I've talked to quite a few nurses and they've shared with me their kind of ethical dilemma on like, you know, like, and as a healthcare worker, like, my kid, is my duty to, to like serve first, or is my duty to like protect my family? Mm. And you know, you see, you see these reports of doctors and nurses like coming home and living in their garage, yeah, because they don't want to contaminate their family. And this is a real thing. And I really wish the general public would really empathize uh, with our healthcare providers. I mean, they're really, uh, they're really suffering a lot right now. Yeah, with how stressful that is, um, the you know, and kind of dialing back a little bit, but what would be your to contrast what what you're doing right now? You know, back in the fall, you know, after you've kind of gotten you know into the program, what would be a, like a typical day like compared to a day that you're going into the hospital right now? Sure. That's, that's a good question, John. Um, so basically, like before COVID, um, you know, we would have clinical hours uh, and then we would have also like education time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would see, I would be, I would check in in the morning at 8.30, would have morning meeting and meditation. And then, and then we're out to work. So oftentimes uh, we go into our own units. I'm assigned to a 10th floor, uh, which is the uh, cardiovascular, thoracic and um, transplant unit. So um, just all of us, we go to our prospective units and we, we visit patients based on need and also referrals. And then and once those are done, we kind of just kind of round our patients to let them know that we are available. And UCSF is really blessed to have so many chaplains. And I've gotten so many responses from patients where they're like, I didn't know there was a such thing as a medical chaplain. And, you know, they're just really a, um, 
impressed with the holistic care. And I, I think that's the kind of approach that I try to uh, share with folks, uh, both in the medical field and non-medical field. And we really need to transition to a holistic approach to healthcare, not just physical. You know, we're looking at mental health as well as spiritual health, spiritual and emotional health. Yeah. And, and so, so you would be going in the patient rooms, meeting with families, talking mm -hmm. with the hospital teams. Um, Absolutely. You know, this uh, normally, it's, it's normal. Yeah. Unlike right now. Unlike right now, John. Yeah. So what is it like now? So like you, did you go in the hospital this week? I did. I, I was just what in, was that? I was what on was that call last night. So I'm a little bit tired, but uh, yeah, I can imagine. Um, I mean, you know, we still have our on-call shifts at night. Um, I, I think the big shift is uh, it's a little bit quieter, but um, it's also kind of eerie. Um, and you can feel the pressure that everyone's kind of holding. Uh, because of COVID, um, I think for me, most of my most of my visits are usually uh, patients who are who are non-COVID, non-COVID patients, uh, I, I, or referrals. Mm. I, I will visit in person. Um, most of my visits, like I said, now are, are telehealth. So a lot of a lot of cold calls uh, to patients and just checking in. Uh, trying to provide some support. And, and as you mentioned earlier, John, it, it's, it's very true. Like it's way different when you're not in the room because mm -hmm. you can't pick up on, on, the, on the body language. And, and all, you know, it doesn't have that personal relationship. Uh, and I was talking to one of my colleagues today, Chaplain Jamie, and he was saying how when we do telehealth, we just have to listen more. Mm. And we have to listen very carefully, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's really, that's really a key, key to our work here as chaplains. Yeah, and I think also with telehealth, like you, uh, you have to be mindful of distractions, like because that really can. Oh yeah. Because the only thing you, I mean, unless you, unless you have video, and even like video like this, you can be tempting to, you know, try to. You know, I mean, I think <laughs> in, in inherently when we get in front of a screen, we all try to multitask, and um, but when we're trying to connect with somebody, and we're, we're the only connection we have is a two-dimensional image and the sound of our voice you really you really and that's the only thing you also get from them that's the only feedback you have to be very mindful of their tone of voice Absolutely. they seem um, distracted um, and also just giving time for them to, to speak because it, it's, it's a little more challenging you know when, mm -hmm. when it's over a phone yeah, and there are folks that who who, who are limited in their speaking ability, yeah. or you know, so there's so many more yeah. challenges. Yeah, totally. Exactly, John. Yeah. What? How are you? Um, how are you dealing with this? <laughs> I'm doing my best, John. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm blessed to have a support group uh, in my cohort in my department. Uh, I have my I have my lady um, that that supports me during this time. You know, she works all the way in LA County or San Bernardino County, um, but um, you know, I, I, I try to decompress with her and, you know, she's really been a source of life for me uh, as I'm alone here and uh, in yeah. shelter in place. You know, it's, it is, it is, I am grieving a lot, to be honest. Yeah, and, I'm uh, sure. It was probably and, very uh, exciting hard. Initially when you started, you know, you're, you're in this in very intense experience, mm -hmm. um, reminds the way you're describing it, having night call and things like that. It reminds me of my own residency and, mm -hmm. And you and you have the you know I'm sure your fellow um, the other fellows in your program come from all over the country and they're they're mm -hmm. all you know, over the world all over yeah. the world and they're they're probably incredibly interesting people and then you know it, February and hits and and now you can't be with them you can only do Zoom calls or Skype or or whatever and it's it's not the same you know it, and it's very but at the same time you know you have to do it you know, but there is that sacrifice and that, that struggle with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the things, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Ta Chaplain Dutch, she was uh, inviting us to really tap into our creative, creative uh, kind of part of our, of our ministry, to really tap into art and music. And in a way that's kind of opened up a lot of doors, not just for, not for medical folks, but just for everyone in general. I've seen just people kind of uh, releasing that stress and kind of decompressing. Uh, through art and creativity. And that's something that I, I also kind of encourage uh, during this time as we are kind of in lockdown and we're separated doing social distancing. 
And we have to find other ways to really uh, to cope and to really de de decompress our, our own fears and anxieties of the unknown. Uh, what, what's been, you know, without going into disclosing any identities or anything like that, what, what have been some of the, the situations you've seen in, in, with, with spiritual issues in the hospital with, around coronavirus? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, just to, just to start it off, it, it's just really the quarantine. You know, when a patient is, uh, is admitted and is, is questionable for COVID and they're under, under testing and just, just waiting, uh, it, it's a very stressful time for the patient and the staff. And I think for me as a chaplain, you know, I have spoken to several patients who were in that kind of quarantine uh, period. And uh, it's, it's a very uh, lonely, lonely place. You know, a lot of patients are, um, it, it's kind of funny, like patients, especially like the really sick ones are the ones who are like most potentially in danger. They're always the ones who worry the most about their loved ones. And, mm -hmm. and that really shows the humanity and the love that we actually all have. Yeah. Um, so yeah. all of our patients, like they always talk about, oh man, I, I hope I didn't get my mom sick or my dad or my mm -hmm. wife, my husband, mm -hmm. my kids. Then it's really, it's really, uh, it's really tear jerking to hear all that. And uh, another, another experience I, I kind of want to share, John, is is, uh, is, is administering, uh, you know, what would kind of is widely socially known as last rites, yeah. which is kind of like a prayer in the last moments of one's life. And you know, I've been, uh, I've been. I've been blessed to have an opportunity with a couple patients to do that. And uh, it's, it's really sad. It's really sad. But at the same time, um, being able to use Zoom uh, and to, to say a prayer with, with, you know, we only allow two people in the room. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just the two family members, uh, the patient in critical condition, and then me, which is on like a tablet, like on a machine. And that experience really, John, uh, just really breaks my heart. You know, I, I, I really, I cried, um, dropped a tear, you know, <laughs> at the end of the service, just, uh, just because uh, I, I just felt so sad that I couldn't be there, mm. uh, be in person. Uh, you know, as a chaplain, as a minister, you know, our, our job is to, is to really step up, you know, when, it, when it's difficult. And, um, you know, we have a lot of rules and policies. I know it's for our safety and, yeah. and for the betterment of, because they want to protect healthcare workers, right? So we don't want yeah. to be down a bunch of chaplains. So yeah, um, and also yeah. the more the less people that go in and out of these rooms, the less chance of it being spread to other, you know, inadvertently to other staff members. But no, that's Absolutely. that's that's very. Have you, um, you know, with with regard to the patients that you know dying in isolation, and not you know and and. And such, you know, it's not, you know, not the, the way you probably would envision you would want someone who, who, like, as you're describing, may be very selfless, you know, someone who got this horrible illness and, and, and now um, is at the end of their life and they're thinking of other people. Um, you know, to me, that's such a, a powerful, you know, moment and experience and, and um, it probably, affects everyone around that in in different ways you know i wonder about the people in the room who are there not as family members but the nurses and doctors who have to witness this ha have you had any um have you you know as part of what you do as the chaplains do you do support for the staff um mm -hmm. do you have and how does that how does that work yeah, uh, that's a great question, John. I, I think just in general, uh, staff are are uh, feeling the stress of of COVID nineteen, watching the news. Uh, you know, we see all, all of our colleagues in the East Coast um, who are just just swamped, mm -hmm. um, and uh, our, our heart really goes out to them. You know, we just sent I think a couple hundred nurses to New York a few weeks ago, and we also have a few nurses from different hospitals who are assisting us. So. Uh, the tension is there. Um, I, I think, you know, I think when, when people are stressed out, John, uh, they get more snappy, you know. Mm. So um, I definitely um, I'm aware of that. So I've been challenging staff to really do self-care during this time, to really be aware that it is stressful mm -hmm. and to name it. Yeah. To name that stress, you know, and, yes. and then and to also ask for support. Um, so I, I think staff support right now. Um, 
is is critical. It's critical because they're they're receiving stress from the media. They're receiving stress, you know, because their patients, especially if they're taking care of a patient who is COVID positive, and they're also concerned for their own health and their colleagues' health who are assigned COVID patients. Yeah, so there's a lot of ethical and there's a lot of it's kind of complicated, John. So yeah. it's a little messy. So. So it's, when it's you a, it's a so it, it sounds like you do some stuff, do some um, telehealth within the hospital. Um, mm-hmm. What what are some other things you do when you're when you're actually going? You know, when you're on duty inside, you know, you actually have to go. What are what are some of the other things that you do? Sure. Um, so besides the telehealth, you know, we we have the regular visits. Um, we also have family meetings. Sometimes we we're we're asked to do a family meeting with the with the with the um, with the team, mm-hmm. um, and uh, working with doctors and social workers, and you know sometimes it's a, it's with the palliative care team. Mm. So uh, those kinds of meetings are prevalent. And also right now because of COVID, we've been having like weekly town hall meetings. Mm-hmm. And my department, as I mentioned earlier, we've been doing a lot of kind of um, uh, a lot of like self care and reflection. Yeah, uh, I think it's important for uh, at least us as chaplains to be to be that calming presence in this chaos. Yeah. Um, so I spend a lot of time, um, you know, not only visiting patients, but also kind of processing mm. uh, because I'm aware that it is more sad or it's more stressful to, to, uh, to hear these things, these great tragedies. Um, I mean, can't get to any specifics, but even last night when I was on call, I know I was, I met a couple of patients like around midnight and, uh, and it was definitely, um, it was a. Uh, it was. It was definitely sad. Um, yeah. It was definitely sad because folks are, folks are alone. You know, and and even if they're not COVID patients, um, it's just everything slowed down. You know, people who who are waiting for surgeries, they're, they're halted. Yeah. You know, we're only doing like emergency. You know, uh, you know, stat surgeries. Yeah. So, it's, it's just it's just kind of gloomy. And I think as a chaplain, our, our part of our job is to bring that calming presence, but also bring some joy and peace into the units. Yeah. And, and in order for us to do that, we need to be at peace ourselves. Totally. Well, do you have like, um, for your program, do you, do you have like a safe space where you can uh, talk about these things that's in your program? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, John. Um, so like I said, we, we kind of do a uh, decompression as a, as a department about once or twice a week. Okay. But we also have our, our smaller, like small groups yeah. in our education system. So in my cohort, um, so in Parnassus, there's, there's nine of us residents and we're divided in four and five. So I'm in that group of four and, you know, my colleagues, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it's great to have support, you know, yeah. when, when it's, when it's stressful and, and, you know, we, we talk together and, you know, we share stories yeah. and, and uh, you know, we, we we really reach out our hand when when it's really uh, a tough day, and, yeah. and I, I I encourage all medical staff to do that. You know, to really mm. seek out help when when you do feel overwhelmed. Yeah. When when I was a resident in at Rush University in in Chicago, um, I was a resident during 9/11, and we had a similar program, um, a, a medical chaplain program that was uh, interfaith. And they actually had um, the Rush, you know, had a, a essentially like a little church, I guess is the way to describe it. They have a, a hall where they would have services and mm. and non-denominational, like not not even just kind of pan-religious. You know, if you're sure. Rush was very forward-thinking. They 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 supported you know all of the Muslim holidays, mm-hmm. Indian holidays. Uh, mm-hmm. Jewish, Christian, you name it. Um, and uh, it was a very, very diverse ethnically and culturally, but also a very diverse uh, spiritually place to work. And um, I do remember that, that, you know, I'm not a very, I'm not a religious person, but having that ability just to kind of, you know, have a place to go and just sort of be with people um, when 9-11 happened and it was, it was, mm impacted our program so much. I, I had several friends who lost, you know, dozens of family members uh, during the attack. And, and I think that the, the chaplains really stepped up and, and made a huge difference in, in, in during that trauma. This, this one is, is, is you know, I, I think there's probably a lot of 
of physicians my age who are, are thinking of parallels or talking about parallels to 9-11, I think mm. this, this disaster is, is, is a much larger not scale um, and it's invisible. And, and it, it, it makes it difficult for us to connect and support each other. And we have to think of different ways to do that. And um, so what I'm, you know, what I hope is like for you, even though you feel like you've, you've had some things taken from you in this program, I, I do think your experiences do this. You're, uh, you will probably, hopefully, you know, 10 years from now, sometime from now, you'll realize that this was a remarkable time to do the, the training and you, you know, experiencing how to help people in a crisis like this um, will give you, um, you know, the, that, you know, the skills and, and the sensibility and, you know, hopefully to help out with the next disaster happens and the next thing that, you know, cause you know, these, this is how, how life happens. Um, yeah. But I was curious to think like, have you, have you, has your program done anything innovative? Have you, have you found like the, has this sparked any creativity amongst, you and your pastors on on how to recreate that connection when you know you can't safely be in a room with somebody. Have you done anything? Has there been any innovations that you found uh, to be interesting? Yeah, I think as far as patients, it is it is uh, it's kind of difficult. I know some of my colleagues are uh, are being creative and and more staff support. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, John, like I think because of the precautions and, and the limited PPEs and and the policies of the hospital, that there's there's our services to patients is is uh, is definitely a, is hindered a little bit, you know. But at the same time, the the good side to all this is is our our the chaplain's um, uh, availability for staff. So I know a lot of my colleagues are are really caring for about a hundred staff a week. Wow. Um, I have I have you know because these staff these staff members, a lot of them, you know, in their, in their normal work day, uh, they don't really get a chance to talk to a chaplain, you know, if, and you know, Johnny, you, you know, you're in the hospital, you know, these nurses, they're working all the time, you know, they don't, they, they don't even get a break, you know, even during their break, they get phone calls. Yeah. So, I mean, for these nurses to get five, 10 minutes with a chaplain during this pandemic, it's really a gift. Uh, it's a really a gift uh, to, 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 to the hospital a gift to the nurse and, and gift to society. It's a time to uh, really um, take care of our, our, our healthcare professionals and, and really acknowledge uh, the work that they're committed to, you know, and their sacrifices they make. That That's amazing. I, I, um, um, I hope uh, you, you and your program write about that and get, get that, you know, to write about that, what you're doing there. Cause to me, that's so important. Even when we're not in a pandemic, I do think there's, you know, supporting the the morality, the 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 humanity in in healthcare because it's such a stressful mm -hmm. job, even when there isn't a uh, you know a, a you know horrible virus around. Mm -hmm. it, it's all it's very very stressful, and I do think we as healthcare professionals don't take that time to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and you know and maybe an, another positive thing from this is that to realize that. You know, we have to take care of our healthcare frontline as much as we take care of the patients in some ways, because they're not, they're, we're not, we're not tools. We're not, Absolutely. as much as we, we work so hard and we want to be, you know, logical and base our, you know, on, on science and evidence-based uh, medicine and, and um, have, you know, protocols and checklists when it, you know, that's still, we're, there's still a human being in the middle of all that and they're not you can't, no amount of intellectualization is going to protect you from that repetitive trauma of, of taking care of very sick, sick people. So I do think um, whether, whether you're religious or not religious, you're atheist mm -hmm. or, or something, I think somebody like yourself who is there to take care of the human being, and think mm -hmm. about the human being in the context of healthcare is, 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 is extremely important and I really, uh, commend you for for choosing that path. What are you hopeful for? Oh, what am I hopeful for? I'm yeah, hopeful I want to end that, these uh, talks on you know, especially when we're talking about coronavirus. It's so easy to kind of 
doom and gloom and every, you know, and just think about what we can do. But I, I want to end these, uh, uh, some of these talks on what are you hopeful for? Hmm. I, think that, I think that's beautiful, John. I think that's beautiful. It's, it's, always, it's always important to, to reflect on both the good and the, and good and the bad of life, right? Um, I think you know for for the COVID nineteen, uh, I guess I'm most hopeful to uh, to return home and to be with my family and to be with my loved one, my my partner, and uh, yeah, I just I miss her very much. You know, I think since this pandemic hit, uh, I think I, I kept looking at the, uh, the the deadline of the shelter in place orders, and it just keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. So. Uh, very disappointing um but i know there's light at the end of the tunnel and, and i know um that the, the that the holy one the divine has put me at ucsf amidst this pandemic for a reason mm. and i'm here to serve and i'm blessed to to serve uh, a, a such a wonderful community with so many good colleagues holy colleagues really really holy folks um yeah so i, I guess i'm most hopeful to return return home to my lady mm -hmm. and to see my mom and my dog and and to and and just yeah, just family. I think I think for me, I, I think I miss my family the most and my, my loved one, my partner. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Robin, so much for for talking with us today. And um, good luck to you with you when you finish and return back to Southern California. I'm sure there'll be plenty. Coronavirus will still be around, and you'll have a lot <laughs> of really good experience and training uh, to help people out. Uh, you know, and I, I'm excited to, to hear where, where you land and what you do uh, in this next phase of your life. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, John, for having me. And thank you for the great work you do at, at UC Davis. Appreciate this. Thanks for inviting me. All right. This video and podcast represents the opinion of Dr. John Onate and his guests. The content is provided only for informational, educational, or entertainment purposes. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions or concerns. Views and opinions expressed by the host and guests are our own and do not represent that of our place of work. While we make every effort to ensure the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or corrections of errors. This website or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with our content establish a doctor-patient relationship. I do not receive any income or gifts from the pharmaceutical industry. I have no financial conflicts to disclose in relationship to the content presented, and if I do, I will present at that time. Thank you.